Brian Solis, author of the new book coming out right now, Mind Shift, Transform Leadership, Drive Innovation, and Reshape the Future all the way from an airport. Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? Wes, I'm awesome, man. I'm here with you at an airport. Are you in, the, in SF or where, where are you? I'm flying to San Francisco. I'm in Orange County. Oh, we could have done this in person. I'm like an hour from you. Really? Where, where, where are you based? Yeah. So I'm in the Temecula Valley. Are you familiar? I'm even closer. I'm in San Clemente. Man, yeah. Well, kind of closer. It's, well, yeah. There's no quick way to get to me. You got to go north around 91 or south, the 76. It's, it's crazy. My, actually, Next my daughter, time. so our friend from Texas, we, we we're good friends with, we just vacationed with, but their daughter moved in with two of my daughters to San Diego. And it was her birthday. So they went up to Lake Elsinore this Sunday. Sunday or Saturday? I don't, I don't know. We recently. Maybe last week. I'm getting old. It all runs together. But uh, so they flew up in the plane. And from Lake Elsinore, they're like, well, there's a Pacific Ocean. It's like right there. But we got like a 3,000 foot, you know, foothills to block it. So we're close but far. Close but far. But anyway. So uh, you are a man of many talents. You know, like my mama says, if it's true, it ain't bragging. Just, just, just tell my wife that. I don't think she believes tell our you. kids that, right? They don't give a crap. Like, yeah, yeah exactly. Dad... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Top, top futurist speaker, one of the 21st century business world's leading thinkers, one of the greatest digital analysts of our time. Man, how did you get those accolades? Did you pay these people off? <laughs> little grease absolutely uh hey if you ain't cheating you don't want to win bad enough i'm just saying okay but i'm, I'm not implying i'm just saying i'll tell you i'll tell you it doesn't come without its knocks as, as anyone will tell you right uh and i still have to work for a living so the accolades are nice uh but at the end of the they day buy i huggies at the walmart will they <laughs> exactly <laughs> Uh, but it's got to open some doors. It's got to make um, it a little easier to get your foot in the door. It 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 does because uh, it you know people people need help, especially now in an era of AI, and they want to know that the person that they're talking to is is not going to be wasting their time. You know that's one thing that not all of us have uh, plenty of is time, and so it does help get those doors open. It does help accelerate a lot of the conversation. It does help accelerate the, uh, the qualification, so to speak. But uh, look, I, I still I still earn that place. I'm still doing my homework. I'm still thinking about things and I'm still uh, still learning as I go. So so what are you doing now? I mean, it's your own thing. It's service now. Like, what are you? Yes. What what are you helping people do with service now? All right, so I'm a, I'm the head of global innovation at ServiceNow. I used to be an analyst and a practicing futurist, uh, writing research, writing books. But then I joined ServiceNow, spend more time with kids, but also spend more time with companies that, you know, you just think about some of the biggest companies in the world. You know, we're, we're one of the fastest growing enterprise software companies, and we provide a platform for them to accelerate their intelligent business transformation. So Talk about right time, right place, but it is putting me in front of executives who are trying to figure out the future of their business because AI, I've been through digital transformation. I've been through, you name it, web one, web two, almost a web three <laughs> and social media, social media. Absolutely. Mo mobile, mobile, the, the mobile res revolution of 2007. And I've never seen anything like this. So it's, it's definitely making for interesting conversations. And then on top of that, just I'm publishing a new book here called Mind Shift, and it's not a book about AI, but it is a book about the need to open your mind to see new possibilities in an era of disruption and also the disruption we have yet to see. Because if you look at, I mean, I can tell you historically, every time I've worked with organizations, CEOs, CIOs, COOs, CFOs, there's this tendency, no matter what the disruption is, to try to get back to normal. Let's, let's just put it into the confines that we know. If you think about digital transformation, it's, it's how do we digitize paper processes? If it, you think about AI, uh, it's all about automation. How can we, we take out the repetitive tasks uh, and save money? But what we're not asking is like, how does this challenge my fundamental assumptions about my business or my market? How do I need to 
go to market differently? How do I need to sell differently? How do I need to compete differently? And what are my competitors not thinking about? Because every single one of those questions has answers to them. And that's where I'm trying to help executives think. Yeah. Um, okay. You have companies like Apple, right? Mm -hmm. Rarely do they invent something, right? They, they typically take what's there, figure out what sucks about it, and makes it better, right? Versus trying to lead the way in something brand new. Mm -hmm. um, AI, okay, obviously it's here to stay, but when should a company spend time on this new stuff versus optimizing what they currently do well and then maybe letting the dust settle and be an apple two or three or five years later say, okay, we see this is now matured. We see the vision. Let's go ahead and implement a proven path versus dabbling with 37 potentials because they're new and shiny. Right, right. The apples of the world are unique because they're thinking so many years ahead about what trends are coming. A practice called foresight, scenario planning, it's kind of like what a, what a futurist would spend time doing. And then they'll figure out the human-centered aspect of it to make it better for everyday people. So for them, human-centered design, user experience, user interface design, design in general, experiences everything to them. Where they differ from pretty much every other company is that they're so far ahead of the game that by the time it becomes something, they're so much farther ahead than everyone else. So that comes with all of the, the prestige, the brand, the innovation, the margins, uh, and usually, hopefully, market leadership. In my experience, other companies tend to wait until that trend or that thing has hit. And then they'll either call themselves a fast follower or a follower. At that point, it really is hard to be a fast follower. So many things have to change in order for you to be strategic if you're trying to catch up to, say, someone like an Apple. If you... Well, not even an Apple. I mean, I, I'm dealing typically with smaller, you know, the, the SMB space. Mm -hmm. So and so that's maybe that wasn't a great example, but, you know, they, they're they not chasing every little thing. You know, and I, I see, I talk with business owners, like, a guy on my, on my Monday call today, you know, he's in a different business, very niche. We can find who he needs to talk to very easily. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, make a list of a hundred of them. And on Friday, we're going to mail 20 of them a letter, you know, mm -hmm. and five days after that, you're going to call those 20 people, you know, and, and we're going to turn this thing around. Right. With just grassroots, because it's just not a sexy high tech industry. Right. So, but I think, because he was saying it, I used to run ads and, and I was on, on the first page of Google. Now it's just so competitive. I can't afford it. Uh, I think I need to be making content. I'm like, the people you're targeting are not going to read a blog post on your business. They're not going to send them a letter, email them, call them, ask for the order. He's like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's really, it, it, no matter the times of disu disruption, sometimes you just got to get back to basics and then remember why you started, right? You've got something that somebody else could, could use, need, help them do something they couldn't do without you. Getting back to the basics and remembering why you started, the rest become enablers. And at the end of the day, people just want to do business with people that they can respect that they could appreciate, and also people who, who have your best interests at heart. Uh, I think the best salespeople I ever worked with, well, let me, let me take that back. I've worked with some of the best salespeople who didn't care about people, but the ones, the ones that I remember really thought about the things that people can't think about. They were usually running a business. They're usually running, I don't even know how many hats people wear these days, but when someone takes time to help you, that's, that counts for everything. I, I used to say the golden rule in life was treat people how you wanted to be treated. But I think that today's competitive golden rule is treat people how they want to be treated. Well, I've always said we as salespeople must adjust how we sell to match how our prospect buys. 
right? Which is very similar, related to that. But are we losing our humanity, right? Society, I think COVID showed us the ugly side of humans. You know, we're all in this together. And then people are fighting in the parking lot over toilet paper. You know, so like, true. are we really in this together? You know? And, and so we're so, what's the word? Like striation. It's like the, the strife, the layers, the, the silos. It's like we're in our own echo chambers. You know, no, oh, great. Here comes a phone call. I'm not mm-hmm. answering that. It's going to be mm-hmm. some, some pushy salesman. But now it's not even a pushy salesman. It's an, it's a power auto dialer. It's a, it's an AI, you know. Hi, is this Joseph Schaefer? You know, yeah, I'm glad I answered this call. You know, <laughs> or God bless them, somebody from overseas. You know, I've had overseas workers for 15 years, but I don't want to speak to them on a sales call. You know, I, I am a freak about hearing mm-hmm. communication, right? I, there needs to be a clear line of communication. We need to be able to understand one another. And companies, they, they cheapen out, man. They, oh, LinkedIn. Link, I had an issue with LinkedIn. Get on chat. Okay. It's a to-do overseas. Okay. Hey, I, I must close this chat and open an email so we can track the ticket. No. I'm trying to work right now. I need chat. I need an answer right now. Nope. Sorry. We can't do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Isn't that so the, they're is, not treating me like I want to be treated. They're not nope. following. Can you call LinkedIn for me? Yeah, I'll just call Reed Hoffman. Uh, I, I, what you're saying is true, uh, and it's it's unfortunate. I look at look the number one priority that companies always think about, whether it's new technology, AI, you name it, is what they call cost takeout. How can they use this new technology to take out costs? I know many CIOs, for example, chief innovation uh, uh, information officers, who are charged with and measured by taking 3 to 10% out in terms of cost every year. So when you give that kind of mandate, of course, Wes, you get that kind of experience. Yet companies that invest in experience, like for you to have good customer service, for example, if the customer believes they're going to get a good experience, they historically have proven they will pay 25% more for the product or service that's similar to everybody else because no one wants to deal with that. No one wants to deal with that. And that's one of the reasons, going back to your Apple example, is they charge these incredible premiums on stuff because you're going to get a great it. experience. I pay it because I call and I get a smart human on the phone in the United States. Yep, I pay or it. you can just go into one of their stores and it'll take care of you. Yeah. But so so why are, the, why are these businesses drive cost out, but meanwhile, they they see that it's crap? Why? I mean... I think, they just, I think they just fail forward. They they drive the company. They get a big package. You know, it takes three years to drive the company into the ground. Then they leave. They fail upwards. And they're like, well, the board, well, they were a bunch of idiots. Well, COVID, well, Ukraine, well, Israel. We couldn't have worked in that rising interest rates. We couldn't work in that climate. And they get to do it all over again. These jackasses make millions of dollars. Yep. If you think about what every CEO, what every leader goes through, you don't get fired like everybody else, you get fired with the golden parachute. You make a lot yeah. of money while you're there. You get a lot of money to leave. And the, the, the board gets a lot of money to make really bad decisions along the way until they make the right decision. And so there's, there's no losing. No one really loses in those scenarios. Not like, not, like, uh, not like the normal employee who has to lose their job, even if they worked hard, you know, in times of like, say, layoffs during down downward economies. But I believe, to your point earlier, I think humanity is a competitive advantage. At least I hope it is. The people who take care of their employees, the people who take care of their customers, they're the long-term winners. If they're not greedy in terms of self-enrichment, and if they're putting that money back into people, right? maybe they don't get to have the 17th helicopter that they wanted to order. They are going to perform better. People are going to love their Sunday nights thinking about going to work on Monday. They're going to show that love to customers and partners. And in my research, I could tell you that I have found that those companies who perform that way will outperform their peers. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine runs a company called Gaping Void, which is a culture 
a culture design studio. They help companies to design cultures of you name it. I need a culture of innovation. I need a culture of sales performance. I need a culture of humanity. And they help leaders design those cultures. They published a thing called the CEO study. And they found that historically, when executives care about their people and they build cultures of empowerment, not self-enrichment, they they outperform financially all of their peers. And that says everything. Well, why did that seem like common sense? But it, but it, it's probably radical. It is totally, it's totally radical. You know, uh, I'll give you another study. Uh, Google studied how their high-performing teams like, just completely outperformed the rest of their company, their peers within the company. And they thought, like, ah, oh, it's probably the smartest people, probably the people who went to the best colleges. It's, prob- it's probably people who are, like, most ambitious. And it turned out that it was the teams. Where it was people- those that listened to the sales podcast. <laughs> it was. Touch no. You stole my thunder. <laughs> it was, it was uh, the people who felt the safest to be able to contribute ideas that they didn't have to worry about would cost them their job, where they could ask questions without worrying about losing their job or their rank. It was all about communication. Go figure. But yes, every single time common sense becomes the thing, we realize how uncommon common sense is. So let me ask you about that, because I've heard the old, the old stories that, you know, like Gmail was invented, you know, from this 20% downtime, like mandatory, take 20% of your time and focus on a passion project or whatever. I mean, I thought they already had that kind of culture of innovation, the openness. Uh, have things changed or, or like that? It's a big company and it's, it's, it, it's only getting bigger and it's always constantly shifting. So you have some pockets that perform better than other pockets. That's really what they were trying to understand is so that they could give that culture to everyone. Now, I'm going to sh- I'll say something a little bit controversial, but it's not anything that's mine. It's actually Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google. And recently he was talking about, uh, at, it was at an event at Stanford, how Google missed the opportunity that OpenAI came in and seized. And they said that somewhere along the way, Google lost its way, that they were allowing more remote work. They were allowing people to sort of enjoy the perks of the job. They they were giving people more freedom uh, instead of driving like what they call in Silicon Valley, like a founder mode. Like everybody's everybody's like an entrepreneur or founder. Teams are hustling. Uh, But he said that that's part of the reason why they got disrupted. He was also saying, like, you know, I'm not out here championing that you got to overwork your workforce, but he is saying that they did lose their edge. Uh, and I think that having a culture of innovation in its most empowering way, that in a, in a way that's very human, is a, is a tremendous opportunity if you allow for, this is what the book's about, if you allow for your minds to be open enough to see the things that are coming and dedicate resources to work on them. So that way you're not responding once disruption hits. You're responding before it happens. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I'm a big college sports fan, and, um, you know, SEC football is big, and the rivalries, like, you know, LSU had Nick Saban and national champion, then he left, and he went to Alabama after going to the pros, and, you know, all the great work he did at Alabama, but it's like, he retired this year, and I'm telling my dad, I was like, the end is near. Mm-hmm. You know, because he was he was simply the best ever. And so by definition, you have to be worse when the best leaves. And so, oh, no, they got another great coach. But I, I saw last week in the Georgia game and, you know, and it's little things. Um, but it, when you know what to look for, it's like this kid came off the sidelines at the end of the first half and committed a personal foul, like a 15 yard penalty. So Georgia opened the second half with the ball and 15 yards. Wow. And they scored. And they started to come. They actually came back from a 28-point deficit. They still they lost the game, but they came back against Alabama. Like, that should not have happened at home. And I told my dad, I said, that's the canary in the coal mine. That is not the same Alabama team. You know? And then what do they do? They lose to, to, to Vanderbilt Saturday. Vanderbilt was 0-60 against top five teams. Now they're one in 60. Yeah, it's a, 
And what does the kid do at the end of the game? Kicks the ball out of the ref's hands. Another personal foul. That never, ever, ever would happen under Nick Saban. So it's, so it's just human nature. And I, I think culture, movie, TV, music, sports, you know, this whole NIL, transfer portal, everybody's all in it for themselves now. That's why Saban retired. I truly believe it. he kind of admitted it. They're so into themselves now. Mm. And, and I feel like that's kind of, that, like I said, since COVID, like I'm seeing these internet bros and, and AI taking over. Man, you can write a book. You can write a $5,000 course in five minutes with AI. I'm going to show you how. I'm like, oh. So I love when you say humanity is a competitive advantage. Can, can we be human? Can, do we need AI? Or do we, do we, just, do, do we, should we just harness it, put it over here a little bit, and so we can be more human while the machines do their things? Like, how do we stay human in this world? There's a, the, my friends over at Gaping Void, we drew this, uh, they're also known for their very incredible, like business, uh, art that they, they create. And one of the things that they, uh, we created for the previous book was that humanity is the killer app. So we said in a world of machines, humanity is the killer app. And here's the thing that's going to blow people's minds. I actually think that AI is going to help us be more human. I'll give you an example. Ikea comes out with this, uh, this AI chatbot called Billy. It's so good that it solves 57% of the problems on the first go around. And people are stoked because they got their answers. They were able to get what they needed. The AI was intelligent. You probably, you know, if you were a customer, you probably didn't even know you were talking to AI. So then the company says, all right, well, we just saved 57% of first round calls. So we could cut all those customer service reps. But they didn't. They reskilled them to be interior designers. And that became a net new business for them. It generated $1 billion in its first year. Why? Because when someone had a question, they didn't have to talk to an AI. They could talk to a human being who could help them and add value to that conversation, help them achieve their desired outcomes or their goals or whatever they were trying to do with the room, the office, the floor, the building, whatever it was. And suddenly people started to get a taste of what good service and good experiences could look like. And so this is the, this is the, the, the message I try to bring to companies is, yes, of course, do your cost takeout, do your automation, but think like Ikea. In addition to automation, augment people to be better. Where can they create new value that people will appreciate? Because when people are happy, people come back. They become loyal. They start to become your advocates. And that's all any one of us could wish for. Yeah. Yeah, it's so smart. It's like, okay, 57%. Like, even if they said, all right, let, we'll lay off 25%. We'll lay off half and keep the other half just for better service. You still, you still make money. But, but I mean, kudos to them. What would you say? It was a billion dollars? Yes. A billion dollars. Like, like, how quickly? One year. Holy crap. That's cool. It, it's not bad. It's not bad, but it's the power of augmentation, whereas most companies would just look at, all right, we, we saved this money. Win, right? The boards would say, like, great job. CEO gets a huge bonus. But instead, they looked at what else could we do. And I think really that's that time. You know, you go back to COVID, and, like, COVID caught everybody in a corner. Digital transformation accelerated. They had to digitize everything because now everybody was working remotely. The minute that we started to get over this, return to office. Let's get back to business as usual. Let's get back into the things that we've been doing, things that make us great. But when real in reality, we should also say, all right, sure. If that's going to be good for everyone, yes. Well, why do we need to go back to business as usual when we can start asking different questions, take this disruption and say, how do we grow from here? Like, for example, I, I wrote this massive piece of research for uh, Worth Magazine recently where I started to ask different questions like, well, how did this change consumerism? How did consumers change their values? Did this affect their beliefs? Being at home for two years is pretty consequential. That's, enough, that's long enough to form new habits. And it turns out there's all kinds of things that we're not seeing. Like, for example, in New York, one of the biggest trends over the last year was the shift from nine o'clock dinner reservations to five o'clock. 
restaurant tours were just hot off guard. Like we had no, we had no plans to start staffing up for five o'clock rush hours. That's just one in a million things, but things like marriage, things like people, uh, young people moving out of their parents' homes. Like these are all shifting people, making less plans, people staying home, people watching Netflix versus going out. All kinds of really interesting trends are going to play out over the long term that if we start asking different questions and we care about people, we're going to come up with some solutions. We're going to come up with ideas rather than trying to force them into the things that they've always done. Yeah. Cool. So what can a listener right now, you know, a small business owner, chiropractor, uh, HVAC owner, small marketing agency, like what do they, how does your book help them? What? What can they do? We've got 86 days left in the quarter. You know, what can they do right away to, to end this year strong, to start the new year strong as a result of this book? You know, or just in general, like where, where does the rubber meet the road right now? Yeah, well, I, I love I loved the, uh, the advice you'd given to, to one of your customers about just getting back to basics, writing letters, getting in front of them, not trying to overcomplicate complicate the matter. I think this is a good time to just learn and listen. Uh, and doing so, you probably end up selling a bit too. So for example, one of the things I'm doing, and this is not a big company thing, this is just a humanity thing. I spend a lot of time with our customers just asking questions. What are you struggling with? Where are you trying to go? Where, where, uh, where do you feel like no one's listening? And then, of course, any good salesperson is going to be able to connect the dots as to how you can help them accomplish a b and c but just the mere fact that you're asking them these questions to them shows you care you're not trying to sell them right any any customer regardless of the size of your business will always tell tell a salesperson i don't want to be sold but they do want to be helped and that means they that just means all we have to do is care enough to help and then we we find out that getting back to those basics actually close close deals maybe not now maybe the next quarter but just care. Start asking questions because I think what you're going to hear, I call it relationship therapy. Today's sales win when people feel like you're looking out for them because people do feel, I will say this, people do feel like your customers do feel a lot of anxiety right now. It's hard for them to make a decision. They're overwhelmed with information. They're, they use technology to their own detriment. They're probably on TikTok and Instagram and and uh, YouTube and trying to figure things out. But the minute, I call it an, an ignite moment, the minute that you have someone's attention and they feel like you have their best interests in mind, that you're listening, that you care, that moment becomes something magical. And you can do with it whatever you feel is going to move that relationship forward. Well, and that brings up a great point, though. It's like, how do we reach them? People are anxious. I get, I get far more spam than than real information. I mean, I spend a lot of time and energy creating filters in my email and, and, and it just shutting things, blocking callers. The spam I get, it's unbelievable. How do we reach these anxious, overwhelmed prospects? We yeah. can't even show them we care because we can't reach them. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. I mean, I got I to gotta launch this book and this is my first book in five years, and the world has changed. It's quite literally changed. You know, I used to have one of the biggest blogs in the world, and it doesn't do what it used to do. I have, yeah. a, I have a ton of followers across social networks. Everybody's attention is all over the place. Everybody feels like they're more important. So believe me when I say I'm trying to figure out these answers myself. But what I do is I reverse engineer. I'm always trying to, to figure out, okay, who are my people? Where do they go for information? What, what's top of mind for them? Where are they feeling the greatest pressure? And then somehow, some way, like some, in some cases, I'm using email. In some cases, I'm using text. In some cases, I'm, I'm knocking on doors. I'm going to visit customers. Uh, but I'm creating a ton of content. I know this is going to sound crazy because I'm not a, like pe people don't want to see themselves as content creators. But if I write an article or if I write a piece, like a, a short email, or if I create like a 15 to 20 second video, if that's what my audience wants to consume, it is all driven by what they need to hear. Hey, I, I, 
I heard you're feeling this way. I, I try to make that connection straight off the, the bat and then and let them know they're not alone and that there's people thinking about this stuff for them. And here's what I would do. And here's the thing that, I don't know, depending on what business you're in, I've learned, especially in these times, that sometimes you have to give away the thing that you used to use is to close. You used to make money off that. Sometimes when you make that investment, people will return it in, 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 they'll return it exponentially because what you're doing in that is one, you're showing them that they, they matter to you. Two, you're showing that you're investing in a relationship and people just don't see that. They just don't see that. So the, the, the easy answer is I, I reverse engineer. It's different for each business. My, my brother-in-law, he's got an HVAC company. Uh, and he's constantly asking me these questions and our strategy has changed almost every 12 to 18 months because the consumer changes. Uh, and so we're constantly trying to figure this out, but he's doing all right now. Uh, and I think his next wave is going to have to, it's going to have to go after the younger audiences as he needs to you know, think about his longevity. And that's going to be Instagram and TikTok. Does he know you're one of the greatest hangers of the 21st century? Is he paying you adequately? I mean, at least a nice bottle of bourbon at Christmas. None of this bullshit fruitcake that gives you the last seven years in a row. Come on. You, I'll, you, should I reach out to him? I'm going to send him this interview. He, he gives me the, uh, the gift of his time. We, we ride Harleys together. It's good. It's good time. We'll drink. We'll drink. We'll have some good wine together. So, yeah, I appreciate his, uh, his relationship. Very nice. Um, so what were you doing in Orange County? Well, you know, we, uh, we moved to Orange County about three years ago. We used to oh. be in the Bay Area. And okay, yeah, yeah. I saw your LinkedIn. It said SF. Yeah, we wanted to try something new. Uh, I still go to SF all the time. That's where my, my work is. Uh, but we, we didn't want to try LA. It's just too crowded. Uh, so we tried, uh, we tried South Orange County, and it is, it is just a nice, nice yeah. chill pace. Now I have to learn how to surf because everybody in my town has a surfboard on the top of their car. So I feel a little left out. Surfing's overrated, man. That's where sharks are. Okay. <laughs> Look, go out there with a hoodie because it's always colder than you think, even in the summer. Okay. Bring, bring a book, bring your phone because somebody's going to get bit by a shark and you can be a hero and rescue them. Okay. And it's always cold. Like I'm from the South, man. It's like, March to October, the water's warm. Rest of the year, it's cold. Out here, yeah. it's like you freeze your ass off in July. Like, what? This is nonsense. This is insanity. Yeah, wetsuits in July. Absolutely. It's crazy. But yeah, it is It is calmer. My son's up in SF and it's like, I, I love seeing him, but like, I don't need to see any of that city. Keep it. It's all good. <laughs> uh, goodness gracious. But we're we're kind of laid back in Temecula. Uh, although we got crazy traffic because everybody moved here and there's no infrastructure. But, uh, you know, we have nice wineries. If you want to come to a nice winery, let me know. I'm going to hook you up. I'm actually going to take you up on that. I uh, I have been planning on doing a nice little motorcycle ride, spending a weekend. So, yeah, I'll, yes, absolutely. Yeah, we're seven minutes from the first winery we belong to. We belong to another one. And a friend of mine just built one. So, uh, wow, we'll start hanging out there. Yes. I'm gonna yeah. Hook you up. yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. I we we, we did this uh, we did this wine tasting festival in uh, Dana Point recently, and it was mostly Temecula wineries, and it was just ah, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, good stuff. There's like fifty wineries now, so it's like a stuff. little Napa Valley. Yeah, man. All right. Well, you've got a meeting coming up. You got a flight. Uh, I'm linking to Amazon. Is that the best place you want me to send people to for the book? Yes, sir. Mind Please. shift, transform leadership, drive innovation, reshape the future. Ooh. Very nice. And, you know, I mean, while they're there, I mean, well, Prime Prime Day, well, this is going to come out after Prime. Well, it'll be Black Friday. I mean, they should buy all of your books, right? Probably bundle them together, get a little deal or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a little something. This one, uh, I will say, though, this is, this, this, this is the time for a book like this. We need... Uh, we need new we need new leaders out there. We need new leaders in a world shaped by disruption and uncertainty. What does it mean to lead? There you go. Get the tools, insights, and lessons you need to reshape the modern business landscape and the world of tomorrow. Amen. People don't spend enough time thinking, planning, 
you know, let, let some silence. Out. I'm going back old school paper. You know, it's like disconnect for a bit. There's having something tangible in your hand. There's a reason it's lasted for thousands of years, right? Yes. Yes. And I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate this time, Wes. I also appreciate your, uh, your hookups for Temecula. I'm going to take you up on that. Let me know. I'll shoot you my cell phone. Okay. Sounds good. I, <laughs> I, I, I sure will. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll go hang, uh, in, in one of your favorites. So, uh, I, I appreciate this. That'll work. Well, great catching up. Brian Solis from the Orange County Airport. Thanks for Thanks, coming to the show, man. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.